And if you would open in your Bibles to the Psalms, Psalm chapter 1, a series we've been anticipating. I was uh, trying to calculate back uh, when we first began to contemplate a series. I think it was two years ago that we first began to talk about a, a longer series in the Psalms. Obviously, we've done individual psalms at different times in life of the church. We've never done a, a, a longer series as this will be. I think we're going to do 16 weeks uh, in the psalms. And we are greatly anticipating the richness of even the portion of this book that we're going to have time to examine. Obviously, there are 150 psalms. So to do a full psalm series take three years. We're not going to do it that long. Uh, but we are looking forward to see a number of different kinds of psalms over the coming months. Alan Ross, the commentator, said, It is impossible to express adequately the value of the book of Psalms to the household of faith. For approximately 3,000 years, Psalms have been at the heart of the spiritual life of the people of God. The array of prayers, praises, hymns, meditations, and liturgies in the collection cover all the aspects of living for God in a world that is antagonistic to the faith. And Matthew Henry, the classic commentator, says this, We have now before us one of the choicest parts of the Old Testament, wherein there is so much of Christ and his gospel, as well as of God and his law, that it has been called the summary of both Testaments. The Psalms are the songs of Christians. They are the words of those who are followers of God, and they are given to us that we might repeat them in all of the various challenges, defeats, and triumphs of our journey towards heaven. The Psalms put godly words into our mouths for every occasion of our spiritual journey. And they don't just give us words to sing. They give us words that can shape our perspective of God. They are the songs of Christians. They are also the songs of Christ. And I mean this in two ways. First of all, these are the songs that Jesus Christ actually would have sung when he took on manhood to save us. It's very helpful to, to read and sing the songs. Remembering these, these are Jesus' songs. Quite literally, these are the songs he would have been singing as the ultimate faithful Israelite, the ultimate faithful king. These are his songs, the songs that he would have been singing as he substituted in our place in faithful righteousness before God. They are also the songs of Christ in that they speak about him. They talk about his righteousness. He fulfills them perfectly. They speak of him as the righteous man as the righteous suffering servant. They speak of him as the conquering king. Often the Psalms speak of the king in a way that, that doesn't seem to appropriately describe David. They go beyond David or any Israelite king, and they can only finally be descriptive of Jesus Christ. They speak of him in both his humanity and his deity as the image of the invisible God. In Christ, Yahweh is present in the flesh, and the Yahweh that the Psalms speak of has been shown to us most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. So they speak of him in his perfect humanity and in his deity. They are the songs of Christ, and they invite us to know him and love him and to grow closer to God in him. The Psalms are quoted extensively in the New Testament. At times, quoted to explain how the Old Testament anticipated Jesus. So they are a very Christ-centered book, understood rightly. They are the songs of Christians, and they are the songs of Christ. I believe they have great power to transform us. If I can just share a couple of our, our pastoral hopes as we get into this series. I think, one, preeminently, that this book would motivate us to walk with God in personal worship. Now, I pray it does more than that. But I pray that perhaps most of all for this series, that this book 
would motivate us to walk with God personally, that our our daily lives would be lived in his presence, that these psalms would be uh, literally in our mouths as we face the ups and downs of our spiritual journey, as we wake in the morning, as we go to bed at night. I want to urge upon us, wherever our current state of personal relationship with the Lord is, I want to urge us that over the next four months, as we study uh, this songbook of personal relationship, that that component of our life would grow and flourish. So if if you are a Christian who never or rarely has personal moments with the Lord, I pray that you allow these psalms to transform that area of life. If you are a person who at one point in your life had great personal moments of studying the word and prayer and worship in private, I pray that the psalms would motivate that area of your life. So our personal walk with God, I pray, would be transformed by this book. And then secondly, our corporate expressions of praise. The psalm is a a book of of individual songs, but they were also, many of them, intended to be sung with the gathering of God's people. And and so I pray that this book will motivate us as, as we gather together to sing to the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray that when we reach December and we conclude this series that that the Lord will have done those two things profoundly in our lives, in our families. I actually want to invite you to do something if if you uh, are are willing. Um, I did the math, and if we read, I think it's 10 psalms a week. Now, that's like less than two psalms a day, because even if you're bad at math, you know that. Uh, Less than two psalms a day. You could read the entirety of the book of Psalms uh, before we conclude this series. Uh, That would be a wonderful place. If you don't currently have a Bible reading plan, and even if you do, uh, two psalms is like less than 10 minutes. It's a few minutes a day. And you could conclude the series having read the entirety of this large book in God's Word. Let me me encourage you to consider that. You might do it with your family. You might do it personally. You might do it with your children. But let's be reading the psalms together. Also, I want to give one more uh, just pastoral encouragement. Thanks for letting me share this before we launch into this first psalm. Um, I would like to encourage us uh, to pick one psalm to work on memorizing as you go through the book of Psalms. Uh, Now, there are short ones. If you're the crazy, ambitious Psalm 119 Christian, uh, God bless you. Uh, I'd love to hear it if you memorize the whole thing. But there are shorter psalms. There may be psalms that are more familiar. But I I would like to encourage us to pick one psalm and memorize it before the end of this, this year. I think that's a very doable goal. My, my hope is that this book won't just be a, a Sunday morning a treat for us. It'll, it'll be a lifestyle examination for us as we, as we enter and kind of dive in to this songbook of God's people. But important to remember, 3,000 years of saints have been reciting and singing and transformed by these words, and they have the potential to do the same thing to us. So this morning, let's begin at the beginning and read Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1, written likely intentionally as an introduction to the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. When we entered this summer season, my 
wife encouraged me to uh, do a few science experiments with, with, with our children. And I'm terrible at science, and so this was really a, a step of faith. And uh, we basically uh, did one of them. Um, so we didn't get a lot done, but we did one this last week, and it was building, they, did, they looked through this science book, and there was a number of experiments that were interesting and so forth. They decided that a periscope would be the coolest one to build, uh, both especially my boys, because uh, it seemed like it had a lot of different functions, and so we thought we'd build a periscope. So we did it right, we went to Home Depot, I got some PVC pipe, and as I usually do in Home Depot, I wandered around for a long time looking clueless, but eventually I found the right materials, I purchased them. They do not have small mirrors at Home Depot. Uh, so I had to go to Hobby Lobby, the store that smells like creativity. And I went in to Hobby Lobby and I found small mirrors and some kind of sticky material. And we went home and we built our periscope. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty, I mean, you know, for somebody that I, that I could build, it's pretty cool. And the boys loved it because if you don't know this, a periscope allows you to see around things. Super amazing boy thing to have. You can see around things. You can hold it and you can see what's on the other side of the wall or above the counter without actually being there. It gives you perspective that you could not have on your own. And that's exactly what Psalm 1 does. It gives us perspective that we could not have on our own. In this case, it's not a physical barrier. It's the barrier of our finite viewpoint. It's the barrier of our this worldly perspective. Psalm 1 is, in a sense, God's periscope for seeing things from his perspective. It's God's perspective on humanity and the future. It's a divine periscope for limited human creatures. Actually, all of God's word is that, but, but Psalm 1, uh, that's a very apt comparison. It is like God's periscope to see around our human limitations, around our being confined to this world and this time, and to see God's perspective about humanity and spirituality and the future. It's God's perspective, and it's perspective that God intends to motivate us and to change us so that we would live in light of what is coming. That we would live with that coming day in view, in light of God's viewpoint. Now this, this psalm basically breaks into three unequal sections. And, and I actually think that the way they typically, I don't know how your Bible organizes it, but the way they've kind of paragraphed uh, the psalm in English is somewhat unhelpful for what should actually be the sections of the psalm. So if, if you notice this psalm, it's three unequal sections. The first section is, is lengthy. It's one through three, and it talks about the righteous man. All right, so that's point one, the righteous man. And then in verse four, there's a turn, and it talks about the wicked people. So verse four and five talks about the wicked, their quality, their character, and their future. And then there's this final concluding summation that talks about what will happen to both the righteous and the wicked and really why that will happen. So that, those are the, the, really the breakdown of this psalm. If we, if we organized it rightly, it would be, I think, verses 1 through 3, the righteous man, verses 4 and 5, the wicked people, and, verses, and verse 6, the divine judgment. So those are three points. Let's just dive in and begin to examine and peer into this periscope and see from God's perspective. First of all, the righteous man, verses 1 through 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed is the man, the psalmist writes, Blessed is the man. So right off the bat, we're told that there is a man who can count on being favored of the Lord and receiving the, the joyful gift of God's favor. That's kind of contained in this idea that he is, he is a happy man. He is a blessed man. He can count on that. And then he's described first by what he is not like. First, by what he is against, and here's why he's described. He is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now, we're going to find as we go through the Psalms, and you may know this, that this is poetry. And Hebrew poetry is not like English. It doesn't work with rhythms and rhymes. It works with repetition and parallelism most of the time. 
So it doesn't, it doesn't rhyme, right? Violets are blue and roses are red and so forth, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work with kind of English rhyming systems. It, it works with parallelism. And you notice that in these, these three kind of progressing phrases, this man, this righteous man, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, he doesn't stand in the way of sinners, and he doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, there's almost a, a beautiful uh, similarity between these phrases, but you notice also that each phrase kind of elevates the expression of wickedness. Do you notice that? So the first there, it pictures a man who is, is unwilling to take directions from wickedness. So you picture a person on the road, and the wicked call out to him, counsel to come in their direction. And he will not do that. He will not go by the directions of wickedness. He closes his ears to evil counsel. And then you see a person who maybe has done that. You can imagine a person who has listened to evil counsel. What happens to that person next? Well, having listened to evil counsel, he now comes to converse with the wicked. And he might be said to stand in the way of sinners. So you see almost a negative progression, almost a contrast here. That the righteous man, he, he will, in the first place, he will not even listen to counsel. He certainly will not stand in the way of sinners. So here's a man who isn't yet walking in the sinner's way, but he is willing to kind of stand in their road. He's, he's willing to kind of face in their direction. And this psalmist says the righteous man will not do that. He will not face in the direction of wickedness. He won't listen to evil counsel, and he won't face in the direction. He won't be inclined or curious about wickedness. He he has no interest in, in going that way, in sort of going on the byway of wickedness. His his evil curiosity is not present. He has no interest to find out what the way of wickedness looks like. And then you have this ultimate progression of a man who sits in the seat of scoffers. So here we have the man who has not only listened to counsel, but now he is the one who is calling out to others on the road. He is the one who's sitting in this chair mocking the way of godliness and, and calling it unreasonable and unnecessary. So you, you see how you have this, this negative progression. In some ways it repeats, but the, the poetry, and, and a Hebrew would have, would have felt this powerfully that the poetry of this he he doesn't do this and he definitely doesn't do this and he definitely won't do this you can also see the way that sin progresses in a person's life in this progression it often begins by listening to the counsel of wickedness and then standing in a place of, of curious interest in wickedness and then finally sitting in the seat of a scoffer and saying godliness is unnecessary it's unreasonable just to use a, a single example that we could see this in our own life I, imagine just the, the simple area of just self-control it just as, as one category of, of righteousness self-control so you can imagine a, a, a an area of life where with self-control uh, you might at first uh, just listen Listen to counsel that says, oh, this, this thing is pleasurable and enjoyable. It might be the counsel of your own sinful heart speaking. It might be an advertisement. It might be uh, someone else who is commending a certain practice to you. But you're just listening to it. You're willing to pay attention to that counsel. You don't immediately rebuke that voice. Huh, Interesting. And then so much does that curiosity arouse in you that you then begin to stand and examine. You're not necessarily uh, there fully committed, but you're willing to be there present, close by to that expression of a lack of self-control. You're willing to kind of put your toe in the water, to use a different metaphor. You're willing to examine it, to think about it, to be as close as you might possibly be. You're standing in the way. You've begun to take actions that walk towards that lack of self-control. And then finally, you begin to indulge in it fully. And instantly, the heart looks down on anyone who wouldn't indulge. You can see this in, even in the Christian church where, where someone who engages in a certain sinful practice is, is quick to say, well, anybody who doesn't do this is, is just legalistic. <laughs> Why couldn't you do this? You're just, you're just being uptight. Chill out. That, that's a scoffer. A scoffer mocks at righteousness. He considers righteousness unnecessary. 
And so what this psalmist says is that the righteous man never goes in that direction. He doesn't, he doesn't sort of listen to the counsel of wickedness. He, he identifies it and he rejects it. He closes his ears and, and runs away from it. And brothers and sisters, I, I think we need that first step more in our lives. We're often uh, bombarded with evil counsel, promoting evil things and acting as though they are good. Have, have you ever found yourself saying when you're watching a TV show, I, I have, something like, why well, I, I, I kind of hope they get together, that couple. And you back out of the, the world of the TV show and you realize, like, what, what am I saying? Well, you're just saying what the show has inclined you to say. That it would be good if, if this, these people were a couple in some romantic way. And, and you haven't brought into any kind of sense of commitment or covenant or anything along those lines, but you're, you've entered the world. And you said, I, I kind of hope that happens. And you back up and say, wait, have I been listening to people making evil seem good? You, you can see how easy this is, but the righteous man, he rejects that counsel. He says, no, that is wrong. I do not believe that. I, I do not listen to that. And I certainly won't indulge in that. As I was reading this, I was, I was convicted of areas where I'm, I'm indulging. I, I'm just, just a little bit of sin, not, not too much. I'm not promoting it. I'm just indulging it a bit. And then how easy it is to look down on those who are more vigilant than we are and call them unnecessary. No, oh, the righteous man that's described in this psalm, he will not do those things. But, but not only does he turn away from wickedness, he also has a, a positive quality. You notice down there in verse 2. It's not just that he's a stoic who's unattracted by any sinful pleasure. And he closes his eyes and ears and see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and just live a very closed-minded life. Now, this is actually a passionate man. He has a sense of, of emotional zeal, but it's just in a particular direction. His delight, in verse 2, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, certainly, minimally, this would have referred to the first five books of the Bible for the writer of this psalm. Probably other books had been written by the time this psalm was written. So th this is a reference to God's revelation, and especially his revelation in its authoritative component. That God has authority, a delightful authority over our lives. And in the law, the, the character of God is revealed. And the glory of God is revealed. And this man, he doesn't just turn away from wickedness. He delights in God's righteousness revealed in his law, in his word. He sees in the, the written words of God the exposition of God's character. And it causes delight to flow out of him. So much so that he meditates at the end of verse 2 on this law law day and night it, it's it's a way used often in the psalms of, of describing the entirety of his life the psalms will say uh, it's it's this end and this end it, it's the same thing we say when we say the alpha and the omega it's not saying he's just the beginning and the end he's saying he's the beginning and the end and everything in between there there is no time in this man's life where he is not devoted to meditation on god's word he has united his life to the word of God. Oh, that was convicting, thinking about this man compared to my life this week. He's, he's linked his life to the word of God. It, it's, it's married to it. It's united to it. There is not a time in his life where he's separate from meditation on God's word. Now, I don't think this picture is a man who's literally walking around all day long, you know, with his face in the Bible. No, I, th these are men of, of action, many of them. It's that in their action, they are mentally attached to the authority of God's word and looking for how that word applies to their perspective in each situation. So, to use a modern example, when, when this man is writing an email, he's thinking about how his word should represent God. And when this man is talking to his spouse, he's thinking about Christ who died for the church. And when this man is caring for his children, he's thinking about how God is a father that loves and cares for and nourishes his children. And when this man is reaching out to his neighbor, he's talking about how God loves the lost and wants them to be saved. He is, he is meditating on God's word, the truth of it. He finds ways to unite it to the entirety of his life. This is this righteous man. 
They're very important. Righteousness in the Bible is both positive and negative. We, we must feel that. We, are, we, we do not see in the Bible this idea that, that the Christian life or any following of God is, is merely avoiding negative things. It is also the positive delight in God and in his self-revelation in the word. Now, we need that because it is possible for our church or anybody that kind of grows up in the American evangelical world uh, to primarily think of righteousness in terms of what we are called not to do. Don't do that. And yet the Bible, at least equally, if not more, calls righteousness the positive delight in, again, not just the reading of, not just the study of, but the delight in God's Word. And listen, I don't think there's a trick to delighting in God's Word. God, God's Word, I've, I've used this illustration before, God and God's Word, they're not like an energy drink where there's a, a quick high and then a big crash. They're more like water. The, the more you drink it, the more you enjoy drinking it, and the more it actually begins to refresh and nourish you. So often, because we're Americans and we like movies and television, we open the Bible for the first time in a long time, and we want this quick high. I just want to feel quickly, quickly. I don't, so I'm, I give up. But God does not work that way. God, God works gradually slowly over the course of continual reading and the delight grows with each day of reading week of reading year of reading and we see more in the the longer time we read we delight more the more we meditate on it, it, it it's like a a treasure mine if i can use that way a gold mine where you certainly see gold on the surface but the vein is richer the deeper you go so is there gold the first time you open the Bible? Definitely. But I guarantee the believer who has read for 50 years is seeing deeper veins of gold than the first time he entered that tunnel. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says, True Bible readers and Bible searchers never find it wearisome. Listen, they like it least who know it least. And they love it most who read it most. They find it newest who have known it longest. And they find the pasture to be the richest whose souls have been the longest fed upon it. Look, there's deep veins of gold down there. But don't give up because you don't see them quickly on the surface. This is the character of this man. This is the man we are called to emulate. He has his life united to God's word. And this is quite different than fitting God's word into our life. God's word seems to be the priority of his day. Let me ask all of us, including myself, this question. Is God's word the single most important thing you do every day? So that even if nothing else got done, that certainly will get done. I think that's why God's word and, and his presence are described in ways like bread and water. Because you are very aware if you haven't eaten all day, if you haven't drunk anything all day. You're very aware. You're just automatically aware of that. That's the way God's word is for this man. Day and night, it says. He meditates on the word of God. Now, the, 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 the focus on the righteous man, it moves from describing his character to describing his quality because of that character. Notice in verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. So he goes metaphorical. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. So this is not a dry desert tree that's just desperately hoping for the next rain. He's continually nourished by his reading of God's word. And the result of this nourishment is that he yields its fruit in its season. I think fruit there is reference to character. And especially character that is a blessing to others. So it yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. So he is so nourished, he is so guided by the resources of God's word that he is evergreen. He doesn't have a season of hibernation because he is continually, he is continually drinking deeply of the stream. This is what this, this righteous man is like. And in all that he does, he prospers. 
I, I think this is, is not a reference to a, a, a guarantee in the modern era of prospering in your business or prospering in your, you know, the length of your car life or prospering in, you know, how young you look, uh, no matter what age you are. I don't think that's what he's saying here. You know, he, he's talking about prospering from the perspective of God's view of life. In terms of God's blessing, he prospers. That, that, remember, we're looking at this from, from God's angle, not the angle of the modern American, you know, let's be as rich as we can. No, we're looking from God's perspective. He prospers. He is like a tree. He's not vulnerable to every wind and gale of suffering or temptation. Have you ever seen one of those, those really great trees? You know, you know what I'm talking about, like those trees that, man, you see them on the edge of the river, and they just seem like nothing could take them down. They're strong they're, they're straight. They're all alone. Not, no, other, no other tree kind of gets in the way of their, of their place before the sun. And they're just drinking in that river and growing powerful and strong. And the branches spread out. And this is a, a fruit tree, so you can imagine the abundance of fruit it would provide. That's what this righteous man is like. It, it, the whole metaphor is designed to, to make this compelling, exciting. Oh, I, I, I can see the value of a tree like that. Not some scrawny little desert scrub who can't hold, you know, hold on to water long enough and never produces any fruit. No, this is a mighty fruit-bearing tree. And in all that he does, because he is delighted by God's word and because he consistently rejects the poison of the evil way, he prospers. This is the righteous man. It's contrasted then. Point two, the wicked people. The wicked people. The switch is abrupt in verse four, and intentionally so. You see the value of the poetry here. He goes from metaphor to metaphor to make it very plain how different they are. The wicked are not so. It's abrupt. It's a sort of an abrupt declaration. Not so the wicked. Not like this tree. What, what's the main quality of the wicked from this divine periscope? Not so the wicked. Not so the wicked. Whatever you think you see, when you see this from God's perspective, you see, oh, not, not, not like the tree. What's the main thing I'm aware of about the wicked? They are not like the righteous man. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. So you can imagine a, a wheat farmer who's harvesting the wheat, and as the, the wheat is, is tossed, the, the chaff, the outside kernel, the worthless husk, it, it just blows away into the wind. It has no strength in itself. It has no root in itself. It can't even, it can't even resist the slightest breeze. It's just blown into nothingness. And, and more importantly, I think, for this parable, it is worthless. Morally speaking, the wicked have no moral value. When you, when you look at the wicked through God's telescope, God's periscope, you see worthlessness. I, I think there's an intentional reversal of how often the wicked are viewed, even in the Psalms, as having great power. Power, having great prominence and confidence and strength and doing what they want to do. For the psalmist, they're the opposite of that. They're like chaff, worthless. I, I think in the modern era, you know those when you um, put like uh, the three-hole punches and, and you, you punch the paper, right? And you know the little like the holes that are left inside the thing that spill over and make a mess and they're just good for nothing. That's like the wicked from God's perspective. They're like the leftovers of a three-hole punch. Man, you look at them through God's periscope, there's just nothing, there's no usefulness to them. They're vulnerable, they're not strong, they're not flourishing, they're certainly not bearing any fruit for anyone else. They're worthless. That is the description of the wicked in this psalm. They're worthless. And because of that, you see their future in verse 5. The wicked, therefore, because of their moral worthlessness, their worthlessness from the perspective of God's value system, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. The, the, the wicked people, when, when the eternal perspective is brought to light, will be shown to have no eternal value from God's perspective. Again, this psalm is not saying that people that don't follow God have no value in any sense. Obviously, there's common grace in the world. Again, this is looking from an eternal perspective. Morally speaking, they will not stand in the judgment because they have no value 
They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Now, here's a, here's a verse in the Bible that directly contradicts universalism. It directly contradicts the kind of happy Santa Claus in the sky vision of God that is present in our country and might even creep into our souls. God will forgive me. That's his job. As the philosopher said, no, he won't, and no, it isn't. Not unless you claim the one place of forgiveness that is possible in the person of his son. Because without that son, you are as valuable to God as the leftovers of a three-hole punch is to you. If you are wicked. Because you have spent a lifetime, God says to the wicked, rejecting the invitation that is present in God's word, rejecting the revelation that is present in this creation, and declaring that God is worthless. And because the wicked declare God is worthless, he will in the end declare that they have made themselves worthless by saying God is worthless. The the only worth of a person is what they believe about God. And the wicked say there is no value in God. So in the end, they are worthless. They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. They will not stand in the judgment because there is no value of God in their life today. They will be shown to have no value in the end. Listen, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, that's very important to understand. Uh, this, we don't preach God's word because we, we, we think we've stumbled across something through our intelligence or something. All, all we're seeking to do is, is represent what God says to all of us. That on our own, morally, and rejecting God, we're, we're all just leftover, three-hole punch leftovers. That's all that we are morally. It doesn't mean there's, a, there's not a physical dignity and good things we can do relatively. It means that if, if we're rejecting God, that's really the only thing that matters in the end. And so if you are one of those who rejects God's word functionally because you've, you've never read it and you have no interest in reading it, and, and you actually like thinking about the kind of sinful curiosities of this world, Look, this psalm, what it's designed to do is to kind of force the periscope of eternity right into your face, allow us to see beyond this world and see into eternity. And in that place, the wicked have no standing. And the wicked are defined as those who embrace rejection of God and reject God's word. It was very important that we feel the warning of this. God will be true to what he says will happen in the end. The wicked people. Finally, you reach the end, and it's the divine judgment. The word for in verse 6 for, why is all this the case? What is the ultimate foundation for all of these predictions? It's that the Lord and the word Lord, L O R D, is capitalized. That means Yahweh, God's chosen, revealed name, the covenant God. He knows the way of the righteous. The word know there, it doesn't just mean he has factual knowledge. It's a word expressing an intimate covenant connection with people. He knows as in he knows savingly. He loves them. He has chosen them. He has claimed them. You can be sure of this, that those that are righteous before God and follow his word are those that God has known. You can be sure of that. What's one way of knowing? Who does God know in a covenantal, close, intimate way on this earth? It's those that love his word and reject the rejection of him. Those are the ones that God knows, and he will know them with a secure, permanent covenant promise that will never be taken away. He knows them. But the way of the wicked will perish. It will be gone forever. There will be no more way of the wicked. It won't seem strong. It won't seem powerful. It won't seem like a legitimate alternative. It will seem like it's nothing. It will perish. It will be gone forever. It will not be worth anything because it will be rejected by God. Derek Kidner, the classic commentator on the Psalms, he says, So the two ways... And there is no third part forever. So the two ways, and there is no third part forever. Now, it is appropriate for us, I think, to apply this psalm, as I have been doing, as a a model for us to emulate. This righteous man 
is someone we are to imitate. It is appropriate. That is appropriate. We, we should be desirous of being like him. But if you're like me, when you read this psalm, there is also a component of despair and discouragement when reading about him. Because this, this man is amazing. Day and night he spends meditating on God's word. He rejects even the counsel of the wicked. There's, there's, a, there's a remarkable glory to this man's righteousness. And yes, I think we, we should feel like, a, like, a, like an Israelite would, the desire to emulate him. But it's also worth asking, is this just a, a kind of hypothetical figure? Well, I think if we look closely, you notice there is something intentional in this psalm that we should notice. Did you notice how there is this contrast between the man at the beginning, verse 1, the man, if you have a little note in your Bible, you notice it is the Hebrew word for man, ish. It's not just person. It's not just general person. It is the man. And then you notice when he talks about the wicked, he doesn't call him the wicked man. Isn't that interesting how he does that? There's sort of a singular, singular man that he talks about. And then when he talks about the wicked, it's just sort of wicked, the, the, the people, the wicked people. So it's interesting, notice the singular man. Now, I think for a, an Israelite, this man who meditates on God's word and rejects the evil way, it, it would have brought to mind God's commands for the king of Israel. Because the king of Israel was called to meditate on God's word, to write it out for himself, to be a sort of a, a spiritual representative of the people. He was to be kind of a, a summary, and you notice that in the history of Israel. As it went with the king, so it went with the people. That is often the history of Israel. So it brings to mind a, a, a particular representative, a particular righteous man. And then when you go to the New Testament, it invites you to see who is the ultimate righteous man. And I don't think you can read Psalm 1 without seeing the face of Jesus. I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I mean, can't, you, can't you see the face of Jesus in this psalm? I mean, even David doesn't perfectly fulfill the righteous man in this psalm. And so like many points in the Old Testament, it leaves you longing. If only there was a, a real person who, who could have lived this out. If, if only there was such a person. And then we get to the New Testament, and, and we begin to see a person who lived this out. Let, let, let's read this with him in view. This opening paragraph, the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, doesn't it bring to mind the Savior in the wilderness of Judah, tempted by the devil, when Satan called him to bow down and worship him and invited him to avoid the cross? And, and doesn't it bring to mind the Savior answering each temptation with a firm commitment to God's authority? Do, doesn't, doesn't Psalm 1 remind you of Jesus in that moment? It does. It reminds me of Jesus. It, it is written, Jesus said, that you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written, Jesus said, that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, Jesus said, that you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Ultimately, it's the integrity of Jesus that is described in this psalm. Because Jesus was truly a man. He was the righteous man. We'll see this throughout the Psalms. Jesus wasn't just a partial man or a fake man or someone who looked like a man. He was a man who lived and bled and was tempted and suffered as a man and most importantly, was righteous as a man. And his righteousness as a man is the reason that we have hope though we don't live up to this psalm. We can emulate that man, but we don't have to be that man. That is what this psalm speaks to us about. And when we consider who is the one who is meditating on the word day and night, don't we think of the boy Jesus in the temple going about his father's business or his biblical knowledge as he disputed the Pharisees, or even his quotation of these very psalms when he was dying on the cross, don't we see this perfect man who truly meditated on God's word day and night? And more than that, 
this psalm describes a man who is united to God's word. The New Testament calls Jesus the word of God, the very living out of God's revelation. The law of God was on his heart. And indeed, it was, it was revealed in his life. God's living word revealed to the word. We see that in the psalm. And, and when you read about verse 3, I don't know of a Christian that really looks like verse 3. Not really. I mean, would you dare to claim that for yourself ultimately? I am like a tree planted by streams of water. I, no, nobody would say that of themselves. But when you think of Jesus, doesn't that perfectly describe him? He is like a tree planted by streams of like a great cosmic tree, the king tree. If you've read Daniel, that same image is used. The, the king tree, the, the tree that spreads his shade over many and brings fruit for the nations and whose leaves are evergreen. And even as Revelation describes the healing of the tree of life, there, there is this quality in Jesus where in his righteousness, not only is he, he good in himself, but he provides for others. So, again, I don't think we're supposed to have some magical spectacles on to, to act like, well, somehow the person who wrote this knew everything about Jesus. No, but I think we read the Bible from back, from back toward front because of the greater revelation that we have in Jesus, and in him we see the perfect righteousness that is described here revealed in living color. It, it is like that periscope angle, just, just this much of righteousness is expanded into a living screen, and we see, oh, that, that is the righteous man. That, that's what it looks like to be the righteous man. And, and yes, we emulate him, but we also rejoice that it is this kind of righteousness that is credited to us. This is the connection between our lived out righteousness, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and our imputed righteousness, the righteousness that is given to us. Jesus is the righteous man in the Psalms. He is the suffering servant in the Psalms. He is the, the perfect one who longs after God with all of his soul in the Psalms and trusts God in suffering in the Psalms. And he is simultaneously the God who saves sinners in the Psalms. You can't read the Psalms without simultaneously seeing the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus, two natures united in the same person. They are both present and they are both present in this Psalm. Jesus is at once the righteous man who represents unrighteous people and the Yahweh who knows those who belong to him. And he is the center of that law because in the law we see the revelation and anticipation of Jesus Christ. So what does, it, what does this mean very, very practically for us? It all comes to this point. What does Psalm 1 motivate you to do now that we've seen? It motivates us to exult in the righteous one and reflect his righteousness in everyday life. It motivates us to exult in the righteous one whose righteousness covers over our wickedness and substitutes for our ineffective pursuit of him and often neglect of his word, and simultaneously to emulate that righteousness in day-to-day -day life, to dive into that word that centers on him, to trust the Lord who knows his people in covenant affection, to reject the whispering of richness, of wickedness, because we know the one who is righteous in our place, and we desire to be like him. 1 John 2.29 very helpfully, I think, I think, captures Psalm 1 in our New Testament understanding of it in just a single phrase. Listen to this. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Since you know that he is righteous, then all those who are united to him will also reflect that righteousness in everyday life. Blessed is the man, Christ Jesus, who is the righteous one. And blessed also are all those like you and me and everyone who believes in him, who is united to him by faith and who can reflect in daily life that same righteousness from one day, morning, afternoon, evening to the next. United to Christ, 
we can live out the righteousness that he has credited to us by faith. Blessed is the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight was in the law of the Lord. And blessed also are those who have been known in him and can walk covered by his righteousness and can know that in the end they will stand in the congregation of the righteous because they are covered by this righteous one and in union with him they walk out in his righteousness every day. Blessed is the Lord Jesus Christ and blessed are those who walk in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we delight in you. We delight in your righteousness. We delight in your rejection of every temptation in our place. Any sin we've ever committed, Lord, you made a choice to be righteous instead. And we receive that account. So Lord, we exult in your righteousness. And Lord, we desire to emulate it. Lord, give us grace to walk in the ways that you walked. Give us grace to love your word. Give us grace to delight in you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.